Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Nancy Birdsall, the president of the Center for Global Development, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Uh, it's uh, a good new crowd, in, in part, from those that we often have at our center events. For those of you who are new to the center, let me just say quickly that the work we do is all about improving policies and practices of the rich world as they affect people in developing countries. And I've been very proud of our global health program over the last 10 years, particularly in development of what I would call new products, not new technology products in the traditional sense, but new approaches to public policy that are more efficient and effective uh, in ensuring the most, uh, the best use of resources in the world to deal with the problems of uh, the poor. Now, all, many of you here will know, I was surprised to hear, that there are still a billion people in the developing world, mostly in the developing world, who suffer from diseases that are neglected. More surprising to me is to hear that there are at least 90 new potential products out there to deal with those neglected diseases. More surprising still, that many of those new products may take years and years and years, if ever, to reach those people because of the high costs uh, of the clinic, late stage clinical trials. And what my colleagues who wrote a very nice blog post today or yesterday in talking about this new report called the Labyrinth, the clinical trials labyrinth out there. I was actually really surprised to hear the tremendous support of places like found the Gates Foundation for development of these new products without apparently, but maybe this is a little unfair, a lot of foresight in the early stages about the next step once the science is done. So with all that, um, that's all an introduction to what you'll be hearing about today, a very, very interesting proposal, pretty straightforward in many ways for accelerating the, the process by which poor people would benefit from uh, the research and the science and, and these uh, new products in the science area. We're very fortunate to have with us today someone who has been thinking about this a lot, an amazing person actually revisiting the bio of uh, Commissioner Margaret Hamburg remembering and seeing, although I knew it already, that she is first and foremost, I'd say in a sense, a medical doctor and a scientist, um, neuropharmacology, nuclear initiative, um, and very interesting for us, really an experienced and savvy public health executive. She was, many of you will know, the commissioner in, the health commissioner in New York City, well known for the work on TB there. Uh, and of course now she worked in the, she was in the Clinton administration in HHS and now of course she is the commissioner of the somewhat beleaguered I think sometimes uh, Food and Drug Administration. So let me not say more about Commissioner Hamburg. She's going to open this session and then I believe that uh, Amanda Glassman, my colleague, will get to work on introducing the, the, the working group which Tom Boyke um, managed brilliantly, uh, the report of which is the subject today. Thank you very much, Commissioner Hamburg. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I apologize that I, I may have delayed slightly the opening of the session, but I was, was eager to be here and to really celebrate the release of this important uh, report. Um, Tom Boyke, someone I've known for a long time and you know, so admire um, your vision and your leadership and your commitment to important matters of, of public health and global development. And I think that you put together a, a excellent working group and, um, and really the, the, the scholarship and the vision embodied um, in this report you know, really does offer prospects for new and better ways of doing this important um, clinical trials work to get opportunities in science to the people who need them. And you know, really, I think, lays out for many of us involved 
um, some important opportunities and in particular avenues for collaboration. We know that these diseases disproportionately affect the world's poorest, often the youngest, and certainly among the most marginalized um, politically of people in the world, the voiceless and the powerless, and that the problem of neglected diseases you know, really does disrupt the lives of individuals and families, but also undermines communities, destabilizes countries, and in our interconnected world, really depresses the global economy in ways that can have profound implications, and at the end of the day, undermines the health, security, and well-being of us all. By focusing on the clinical trials, practices, and regulatory infrastructure that's needed to move therapies for neglected diseases from discovery to delivery, I think this report certainly gives us at FDA much to contemplate and consider, and I think you know speaks to many other critical stakeholders and partners, and so I really am grateful for this important work. I was late getting here because I had spent um, the day um, at the White House dealing with an issue that is a little bit different than this, but another issue about making sure that people get the drugs they need on drug shortages. And I, I was um, spending time in the Roosevelt Room, and for those of you that know anything about FDA history, Roosevelt, the Roosevelt, important players in our history, Teddy Roosevelt actually started the first um, iteration of the FDA back in 1906, and then um, FDR really um, ushered in the, the modern era of the FDA in, um, in uh, the 1930s um, and gave us a lot of our important authorities. And I was reflecting that he's famously known for his advice to speakers about um, the three cardinal rules, be sincere, be brief, and be seated. And I was thinking, um, I don't know how he'd feel about you know, being late. Um, I'm sure that he wouldn't approve. Um, but, um, but I was also reflecting on him because he certainly was an individual that, um, that thought deeply and had a lot to offer on the subject of how do you address issues of importance um, for unmet needs and to make sure that the most underserved amongst us um, have the voice from, from government and elsewhere that's, that's necessary. He also um, had important advice for us about the importance of cooperation and um, said that competition can only get you so far and at the end of the day, cooperation is the thing we, we must most strive for. And I think that's exactly the spirit with which we really need to address the problem of neglected um, diseases. We really must put our heads together. We must listen and learn from each other, and we must work in partnership to think anew about dealing with neglected diseases. And this report, which brought together experts from academia, government, industry, and the donor community, is really an excellent example of new thinking about neglected diseases. And I'd like to say that the FDA, too, um, is exhibiting some new thinking. There are many out there who, who don't think so. They think we're a, a rigid, backward-looking bureaucracy. Um, but we really are focusing on new and innovative ways um, of doing things to encourage and speed the development of drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics that will open new windows on prevention and new doors to treatment, not just for neglected disease, but for all diseases. And I just want to mention a couple of, of recent examples. We have had the opportunity to review and approve an extraordinary number of, of important new drugs over the course of this past year including the first drug ever shown to be effective in extending the lives of patients with metastatic melanoma, two new treatments for hepatitis C, the first drug uh, to treat lupus in 50 years, and the first drug um, to treat Hodgkin's lymphoma in 30 years. And this is clearly good news for countless numbers of patients and their families. 
But I think that what's also important is that we have undertaken a number of new initiatives and new ways of doing things that really will help support the production of treatments for neglected diseases and the clinical trials that underlie them. First, we're fostering new approaches to advance the development of so-called orphan drugs for rare diseases, or those affecting less than 200,000 Americans. This is obviously a set of diseases, some of which fit into the category of neglected diseases, but it's, it's a, a bit different. But why I want to mention is that, that through our work in orphan drugs, we have really moved in important new ways in terms of flexibility in reviewing and evaluating clinical trials data for orphan drugs. When you have a disease where there's a limited number of people affected by it, we have to do things differently. Um, and we have to think about clinical trials um, that are designed uh, to give us important answers with fewer numbers of patients and also um, in shorter time frames and, and, and we you know, also seek to reduce the burden on companies that are, are working in these important arenas. So for example, a few years ago we um, approved a treatment for, for Pompe disease, which is a rare genetic disorder that causes debilitating muscle weakness. And we did it on the basis of a single pivotal study using only 18 patients. So some would tell you that it simply wouldn't happen at the FDA, but it has and it continues to. Um, second, the FDA is also targeting neglected diseases with our priority review voucher system. This was initiated in 2009 and it provides a transferable voucher to any company that obtains approval for a treatment for one of 16 neglected tropical diseases including malaria and tuberculosis. And the voucher can then be later used to accelerate review of an unrelated drug. And the idea was to use this as an incentive to bring um, important companies into work in the neglected disease area. And already one such voucher has been used, it's been issued to Novartis for its anti-malarial drug, Coartem. Third, we're engaging in new and stronger global partnerships to address neglected diseases. You know, really, the forces of globalization have meant that we now live and work in a world where people and nations are more interconnected and more interdependent, and that we all understand and appreciate that a disease in one country can be um, in another in a matter of, of hours, if not days. And so global problems truly do require global solutions. And if we're really going to ensure that safe and effective treatments for neglected diseases get to those who need them, as of course your report asserts, we need to continue to find new ways to improve clinical trials and regulatory pathways, and we must do so as a global scientific enterprise. And if we're to be successful, I think we also in the clinical trials area have to recognize that we face some additional challenges as a scientific um, community. Um, things seem to come in threes, safer, faster, cheaper. Um, but we have three additional challenges that must be intertwined. Specifically, we need to ensure that our clinical trial standards are safe, our science is sound, and our resources are strong. And all of these are important, and all of these underlie our ability uh, to make our difference. The first challenge um, ensuring that our clinical trial standards are safe and effective. This means that regulatory agencies must maintain good clinical uh, practice standards and have effective and coordinated policies and regulations that can support both ethically sound and scientifically robust um, conduct and oversight of clinical trials. Um, you know, this is, this is clearly important and there, there are some key ways in which we must advance and improve good clinical practice standards. First, we must engage in a global regulatory conversation and action through participation in international initiatives and with multinational organizations. We must really work on harmonizing um, the global standards for good clinical practice um, as part of clinical trial research, and the countries that are more sophisticated and have more resources must provide technical assistance and support to those nations that are, are building 
their capacity and their understandings. We also, of course, must make sure that our science is sound, and we must really work together as a global scientific enterprise um, to make sure that we are gathering the right data in the most cost-effective um, and efficient way as possible so that, that the clinical trials research that is done will, in fact, be able to inform sound uh, regulatory decisions and that the regulatory process can engage with the clinical trial research um, activities early and with clarity so that the regulatory process can serve as a gateway to ensuring safe and effective medications, but not as a barrier um, that delays um, the time frame for translation of important opportunities in science and technology uh, today, but make sure that we all work together, that we all pull together to ensure that we get important new therapeutic opportunities to people as swiftly and surely as possible. And part of that is, in my view, really developing a whole new area of science as an important foundation for regulatory work and drug development, and it requires the cooperation of academia, industry, and government. And that is really building out regulatory science, the, the knowledge and the, the tools, the strategies that are necessary um, to ensure the safety and efficacy, performance, potency, and quality of medical products and the most targeted and efficient um, drug development process. And I think there are enormous opportunities to work together as a scientific community. And one of the key areas of focus is really how do we do clinical trials? How can we bring new and better science to the clinical trials research world? How can we develop new clinical trial analytics and uh, models that allow us to get the robust scientific answers that we need, but to do so in a, in a way that, that requires smaller clinical trials, is less costly, and enables us to get those important answers more quickly. So I am really very excited by the ideas and the framework offered um, by this new report. I do think it has a lot of important messages and mandates for FDA. I think it also underscores the critical importance of collaboration and cooperation across disciplines and across national boundaries um, and across sectors. So I'm so pleased to, to be here today to really help launch this new report, to listen and learn from the panel that will follow, and to thank the Center for Global Development for enable this, enabling this important piece of work to go forward. And I hope to work with you and, and all of the participants in putting the report together as we move from what is a set of really good ideas to their implementation in the real world. So thank you very much. I look forward to the rest of the session. OK, well, many, many thanks, Dr. Hamburg, for your commitment to bringing safe and efficacious products to those in needs and for your words here with us today. Um, I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm director of the Global Health Policy Program here at the Center for Global Development. Um, and we'll now turn to the launch of the long-awaited uh, working group on clinical trials and regulatory pathways. This group was motivated by the very limited regulatory capacity that exists in many neglected disease endemic settings the need to carry out these studies simultaneously in multiple countries, and the ethical and the economic imperative to assure patient safety while minimizing costs and unnecessary bureaucracy. And this working group set out to propose better alternatives to the status quo model of trials and their regulation. The report, much of it was made possible by the leadership, expertise, and dedication of the working group's chair, Tom Boyke who will go through the highlights of the report now. Tom is unfortunately a former research fellow at the Center for Global Development, but he remains uh, inextricably linked with us. He's now a senior fellow at the Council for Foreign Relations, where his research is focusing on legal and regulatory issues in global health, 
technological innovation and delivery, and international trade. He's also an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown and serves on the Institute of Medicine's Committee on Strengthening Regulatory Systems in Developing Countries. So Tom, welcome. Tell us about the report. Well, on behalf of the working group, I'm very pleased to welcome you here today to this launch of our report on improving clinical trials and regulatory pathways to fight neglected diseases. It being Halloween, it seems uh, only fitting that you uh, spend the evening, or at least part of your evening, listen to a guy with a funny Eastern European name talking about human experimentation. <laughs> so I'm... Uh, <laughs> Very pleased I can perform that role for you. Uh, but before I do, there's uh, just a few acknowledgments. Uh, the first, of course, I would like to thank Commissioner Hamburg for uh, her very kind remarks and for being here. For those of you who do not know, the White House made a big announcement today that impacted FDA, so it is really um, quite, a, quite a testament to the Commissioner's commitment to these issues that she should be here on a day where there's so many other distractions. Uh, I would also like to thank some of the many people who made today in this report possible. Uh, first, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for their financial support for this uh, working group process and their intellectual uh, uh, participation, participation in this, uh, in this uh, working group and report. Uh, we've had really just fantastic support from the foundation. I'm grateful for that. Uh, I would also like to thank the law firm of Cummington and Burling. I don't know if there's anybody here from there, but for their pro bono support uh, in some of the work that we've done today. Uh, of course, Nancy, Amanda, uh, Cindy Prieto, Vidge, uh, John Osterman, Ted, Jessica, Kyla, Ruth Levine, CGD staff, both present and former, uh, for all they did to uh, make this uh, report possible. And last, but certainly not least, the members of, the, uh, of this working group. We had an amazing cross-section of individuals as part of this working group, uh, regulators, uh, donors, sponsors, uh, investigators, all involved in the uh, clinical trial process for neglected diseases, as well as uh, global health and legal experts. And it really uh, was their, uh, their commitment and involvement that allowed us to transform a set of broad ideas into tangible, workable uh, proposals. And these are uh, some of the organizations that uh, were involved, but they're also listed in your, in your report. My remarks today are going to proceed in three parts. First, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the tremendous recent progress that has occurred in building a pipeline of candidate drugs and vaccines for neglected diseases, as well as some of the looming challenges that exist as these move to late stage clinical development. Then I will talk about the need for a more sustainable strategy that brings into better balance clinical trial costs, finances, and risk to subjects. And last, I will put forward the two-pronged strategy that this working group developed to help bring about that balance. So, as I mentioned, this starts out with a good news story, which is over the last 10 years, there has been tremendous investment in uh, building a pipeline of technologies for neglected diseases. Led by the hard work of product development partnerships and the support of the Gates Foundation, the U.S. National Institutes of Health, and other donors, there are now dozens of drug, vaccine, and diagnostic candidates in the pipeline. This figure represents data from BioVentures for Global Health, which were also involved in this working group, and it shows uh, what they have as the current state of affairs in the neglected disease pipeline for drugs and vaccines, and they have 253 uh, candidates. Uh, this is hopeful news for the over 1 billion people, including 400 million children who have neglected diseases, and many of whom suffer uh, without the hope of any effective treatment. But there are some challenges that, uh, two sets of challenges really that will arise as these candidates move to later stage clinical development. The first is that there's not enough clinical research and regulatory capacity in the countries where these clinical trials will need to occur uh, in order to complete clinical development of these products. Pivotal clinical trials on safety and efficacy 
need to occur where the disease burn exists where that where the products will be used and for neglected diseases this means low and middle income countries many of which are ill prepared for a large influx of clinical trials to be run in support of licensure of a drug or a vaccine and this gives you some idea of the geography of neglected diseases and where most of these trials will need to occur we looked at the data that was registered on clinicaltrials.gov for neglected disease products and what we found and not surprisingly is two-thirds of those are occurring uh, two-thirds of those trials are occurring in uh, low and middle income countries with most of those happening in Africa the region that has the least uh, uh, regulatory capacity to support these trials not surprisingly this uh, proportion increases as you move to later stage clinical development Again, these are the trials that need to be run uh, to establish the safety and efficacy of the product. But these also tend to be the more complicated trials that have additional regulatory and ethical uh, burdens uh, to them. This is uh, also the challenge, regulatory challenges in these environments are compounded by the fact that many of the products involved are complex. Most of them are vaccines, which need to be tested in healthy subjects. And a lot of the subjects involved are highly vulnerable in pediatric. And again, looking at the clinicaltrials.com data between 2003 and 2009, you see that neglected diseases are far more likely to involve uh, uh, pediatric subjects. And most of those pediatric trials are, again, happening in Africa. There's nothing scandalous about that, I should say. This is, of course, where the disease burden exists. It's very quite natural. But again, it does present a, a series of challenges about being sure to uh, have the uh, support in place for those countries to be able to uh, oversee those trials. Lastly, these challenges are compounded even further by the fact that they're often multi-country, multi-center trials. Um, this means uh, that really three, more, three times more likely uh, to involve multiple countries. This could reflect a lot of perfectly legitimate reasons, such as uh, limited site capacity in one country needing to go to sites in other countries, uh, or epidemiological reasons, or uh, policy objectives to run the trial in multiple countries. But it does propose, uh, does um, involve challenges in not only going through one uh, poorly uh, defined and under-resourced regulatory pathway, but going through multiple at the same time. And this can add additional delays and uncertainty and cost to a process that is uh, already uh, can be uh, quite costly. And with that segue, I'll talk about the second set of challenges, which are around funding. Uh, clinical trials, as you know, generally are uh, expensive. They represent 70% of the cost of development of a product. They are lengthy. Uh, clinical development process can often require a decade or longer. And they are uncertain with few candidate medicines ever uh, reaching market. There are a variety of reasons why this is the case, many of which are discussed in the, uh, in the report. But one just to pull out today is that, uh, particularly under uh, commercial clinical development models, there is a tendency to overinterpret regulatory guidance in order to, uh, uh, because the, the rewards of early market entry with longer patent life and the competitive rewards of uh, that early market uh, entry are so great that uh, uh, there, there tends to be a, a, a propensity to over, uh, over interpret these regulatory guidances. Of course, over time, uh, you know, uh, uh, clinical trial sponsors design trials to look like the trials that have been approved before by regulatory authorities and ethics committees. Those regulatory authorities and ethics committees look for trials that look like the ones that succeeded in the past, and this inflexible, precedent-driven approach can really drive uh, clinical trial costs. In the uh, case of uh, global health, uh, there may not be enough funding uh, to support clinical development of all the products in the pipeline for neglected diseases. One estimate of what the funding needs might be for late-stage clinical development was done by Dahlberg Advisors in 2008, and they looked at just the drugs in the pipeline, which at the time were 63, and why $500 million was spent in building that pipeline. It would require 6 to $10 billion to complete clinical development of those products, and that's just the drugs. 
in the pipeline so it really gives you a sense of how costs can really balloon in late stage clinical development this in mind in our view this calls for looking at new approaches certainly there is a need for more funding for late stage clinical trials there's also a need for technical support to ensure those trials are conducted up to good clinical practices and laboratory standards as the Commissioner pointed out but given the fact that donor funding is increasingly scarce in the current global economic environment new funding is not likely to be forthcoming the global health community has spent a lot of time really looking at prizes and other incentive mechanisms or innovative financing and all those are useful but prizes and incentive mechanisms need government funding typically and innovative financing particularly around taxes require political will to tax your population in support of the health needs of low-income countries and I think in the current environment that will is likely lacking as well so what that calls for is in order to ensure the continued vitality of this pipeline and deliver on the promise that you have now new approaches that also address the issue of reducing costs reducing delays and reducing the risks to subjects and that's what this working group undertook as its mandate we came up with a two-pronged approach the first is looking at the possibility of regional approaches to clinical trial regulation the challenge with capacity building uh, for a clinical trial oversight is that a country by country approach in low-income countries is just not feasible with cost restraints at the same time given the local implications and uh, the community level concerns most countries are not willing to uh, forego their regulatory oversight or ethical oversights of clinical trials and defer to a developed country uh, regulator like the FDA or like EMA to do it for them so what we have proposed here is a single integrated joint review process by which clinical trials in multiple countries are jointly approved and overseen uh, the benefits of this strategy are that it pools uh, scarce existing regulatory and ethical review capacity to support these trials it improves coordination uh, thereby uh, uh, helping to protect subjects reduces national inconsistencies and overlap and it provides a more efficient platform for uh, capacity building and donor support uh, in this joint review process regulators continue to exercise their sovereignty together with peer countries in the region and they continue to hold the final decision on the approval of clinical trials capacity is built by doing not by training programs or harmonization done in the abstract and uh, the last benefit of this approach is that it is actually this type of joint review approach has actually worked um, which puts it in great exception to most international harmoniz regulatory harmonization efforts uh, which are tend to be protracted and uh, uh, less successful and the reason it has worked is it again involves this collaborative approach that reinforces itself over time you can start out with a small set of projects and uh, voluntary and it builds uh, towards that integration not only has it worked in developed and developing countries alike and for a whole range of regulatory issues including clinical trials it is uh, cheap and relatively fast there have been successful joint review mechanisms implemented in Africa and Europe for a million dollars per annum and in less than three to five years um, so we really think this approach offers a lot of uh, potential but the time to pursue it is now not only are there the demands of the current uh, product pipeline for neglected diseases and the challenges that they will impose many low-income country regulators particularly in Africa haven't really yet invested in developing their own uh, uh, full uh, uh, regulatory platform for overseeing clinical trials which means they're much more amenable to working together it is certainly a lot harder once you've adopted your own idiosyncratic regulatory approach and you've seen the difficulty of uh, harmonization of developed country regulators in part in light of that entrenchment in particular approaches uh, because of the global health uh, product pipeline for neglected diseases donors are interested in ensuring the viability 
of these clinical trials and the safety of subjects involved so there's some funding potentially developed country regulators are eager to look to cooperative approaches to equip them to oversee the increasing amount of clinical trials that are happening abroad which uh, there have been reports both by the FDA's uh, inspector general and by the EMA itself looking at how many of the uh, the products they receive for our applications they receive for licensure involves some foreign clinical trials and it's it's quite a large number an increasing number of those are happening in low and middle income countries so there's that incentive as well and last developing countries have are pursuing these approaches both in Africa and Asia with the support of the WHO you've seen uh, the launch of a number of initiatives to try to look at regional approaches to clinical trial oversight in the African uh, Vaccine Regulatory Forum and in ASEAN as well they are looking at these types of approaches. The contribution of this working group has been to uh, try to provide the evidence analysis and minimum requirements of moving those uh, cooperative regional approaches forward into something more sustainable and durable. Uh, we did this by examining the data on individual trials as well as the data overall on neglected disease trials to identify the patterns and where some of the uh, unnecessary costs and delays might be. We assessed existing precedents for regulatory cooperation and looked for what has worked in the past and the different elements that might be applicable here. We solicited extensive input from uh, stakeholders and uh, some of our pro bono partners in order to develop a, uh, a design and a procedure that is both practical, sustainable, and even uh, workable even in low uh, income country regions. I'm not going to go through the details of this outline here because you have it in your report, but in short, we've proposed a model that is respectful of sovereignty and local accountability that is voluntary and at least initially non-binding that uh, reduces regulatory hurdles instead of imposes new, imposing new ones that is self-supporting and is able to be linked to existing initiatives and structures. However, streamlined regional approaches to clinical trial regulation alone are not going to uh, sustain uh, clinical development of life-saving uh, of neglected disease therapies. You need better, faster, cheaper trials as well to reduce some of some of that cost. And in this area, the working group has proposed uh, proposals really in three areas. The first is simplifying and focusing the expensive pivotal trials that are run for to establish safety and efficacy only on those objectives that are required to support licensure shifting the epidemiological research and some of the policy research into phase four studies, which these studies can be run cheaper with less uh, rigorous standards to them in a, a greater number of sites. Uh, we've also proposed engaging local investigators and uh, independent expert stakeholder early and pressure testing protocols to try to break this pattern of precedent-driven approaches to clinical trial design and practice. And by uh, engaging early with uh, the folks on the ground or the people that have worked on the ground before, it allows you to ensure trials are feasible, simple, and uh, cost effective. And the last thing we've uh, proposed in the area of clinical trial practices is looking at lower cost ways of clinical trial, doing clinical trial monitoring. Clinical trial monitoring, for those of you who don't work in uh, clinical trials, is an enormous driver of cost. It's really quite, quite shocking. Uh, clinical trial monitoring can be as much as one-third to two-thirds of the total cost of a clinical trial. And there are a number of approaches that uh, people have successfully used in low-income uh, countries that haven't really been fully adopted by the uh, uh, global health community. These include electronic data capture or centralized statistical monitoring. And the ability we really see these sets of recommendations working in tandem because, of course, by pooling regulatory capacity, having a regional authority that you can work with, it allows you potentially to adopt approaches that uh, break this, uh, this uh, precedent paradigm and are more cost effective and more appropriate for the uh, settings in which these trials are done. 
moving forward with these recommendations is going to require contributions from a number of different stakeholders it will require political commitment and manpower from developing countries it will require some amount of seed funding even if it's modest from donors and they also donors will need to require that their grantees use this regional pathway and adopt some of these more efficient clinical trial practices from developed country regulators we need technical assistance for these regional platforms as well as the credibility they bring when they support these types of international initiatives and last we need from sponsors investigators really their participation their their willingness to pursue these items and I'm very fortunate here today to be joined by a number of members of the working group who represent some of these communities and can provide further detail on their thoughts about how to bring this report forward and should I I'll just introduce them quickly first David Schultz I think that you have the bios with you so I will not go through all their titles or perhaps Amanda will be planning on doing that from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Orrin Levine from John Hopkins Paul Huckle from GlaxoSmithKline and Mike Brennan I would ask that you would join me up here and Amanda as well Okay, well, we'll start with David. And then once you've done about two minutes each, you'll have to be really concise. Uh, then we'll have another round of questions and we'll turn to you for questions and answers. So David, please. All right, you'll have to cut me off. No problem. Can right, do. So I want to start by just, uh, sorry. Are we good? Okay. So I want to start by thanking the Center for Global Development for uh, convening us today and for sponsoring the report. It's very nice to have the FDA commissioner here, so thank you, Commissioner Hamburg. And I really want to recognize Tom Boyku, who did a spectacular job of pulling this working group together, I think conceiving of the project and also leading us uh, through it. And then, of course, it's been a pleasure to get to work with Michael and Paul and Oren and the other members of the working group. I've learned a great deal in addition to just enjoying to uh, getting to spend time with them. So as the world's population surges past 7 billion this week, I think I'm more mindful than ever about the fact that we can be confident that there have never been uh, in the history of the planet more people who actually do suffer from neglected diseases and need more urgently the types of products that Tom was alluding to and that we're talking about uh, here today. And two weeks ago, I was actually in the northeastern state of Bihar in India and meeting with uh, rural health care providers, physicians, some of our grantees, and most uh, importantly to me, um, patients and individuals who actually suffer from diseases like tuberculosis and visceral leishmaniasis and syndromes like diarrhea and pneumonia. And it just reminded me very tangibly of how great the need is, but also how vexing the challenges are. When I just think about uh, all of the day-to-day the -day challenges that we faced uh, in Bihar, uh, thinking about doing uh, clinical trials in the developing world is a phenomenal undertaking. Fortunately, we actually have a pipeline that is truly historic. The pipeline that Tom showed looked nothing like this 10 years ago or 15 years ago, and 20 years was truly but 20 years ago was just a pipe dream. So I also think that we're at this enormous confluence of tremendous need, tremendous opportunity, and also tremendous promise. And, and none of us should forget that as we sort of think about all of the challenges that are in front of us. From the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation perspective, we fund um, a pipeline, at least in part, that is now more than 100 products strong when we consider drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, and vector control products for vectors that spread diseases such as mosquitoes and sand flies. And more than two dozen of these uh, product candidates are now in, in late phase development, which as Tom alluded to, 
uh, is a very expensive and resource consuming uh, stage of development both from a dollar standpoint but also from a personnel standpoint and also uh, when we think about the research subjects or the patients uh, in developing countries. The Gates Foundation actually supports 15 different product development partnerships or PDPs and I think it's striking to know that over the next two years uh, these PDPs intend to carry out more than 100 studies in 41 countries covering 19 different disease areas and involving more than 153,000 research subjects. So I think just from those facts alone you begin to get a sense of how staggering the challenges are in front of us. So in our report we call for what I think are very common sense changes with respect to regulation and execution of clinical trials, especially during the later phase of development. And you know, it's my belief that these changes can really make a difference, ultimately delivering more new products for neglected diseases more quickly to what I would argue are billions of people in the world who need them most. Thanks. Thank you, David. Okay, Oren? Thanks. Um, I want to also uh, thank CGD and Tom, and, and I won't spend a lot of time extolling Tom's virtues, but I will say this. <laughs> that Tom has to be the best writer that I have ever worked with. If you ever have the opportunity to work with Tom, take it, because every written document is perfect the first time you get it. Um, I, think, um, I think that uh, uh, I, I represent the neglected investigator perspective today. Um, <laughs> and I, I want to illustrate this a couple ways. One is um, one indelible impression from our working group meetings was I, one of the first meetings um, we had this guy come and he, he said he, he, um, he's a process management guy. And he made a Gantt chart of what's involved in an oncology trial. It was something like, the numbers might not be exactly right, but it was something like 10 feet long, 4 feet high in 8-point font. That's what it takes to do a, a trial. And so I thought, you know, this is Halloween, and, and what if I wanted to dress up as an investigator uh, tonight and go around trick-or-treating? Then I thought about all the different costumes I'd have to wear. Um, I, I'd obviously be a scientist, right? Because um, that's where it starts. But then in order to write my consent forms, I've got to understand bioethics. Then to write my contracts with my sites, I've got to have background in legal uh, 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 background. Then um, to make my Gantt chart, I've got to be a project manager. Well, all of my sites are in different places, so I better also know um, uh, currency exchange rates. Um, I've I've learned that I I've learned a lot about currency exchange rates, um, not in my public health training, but as a uh, principal investigator. Uh, you got to be a travel agent, an international shipping specialist, a negotiator par excellence, and an HR specialist at least. So these are all the costumes that you could put on tonight if you wanted to be a a PI. So I thought to myself as an investigator. Um, looking through the lens of what's been proposed, how would I, re how would I react to these uh, proposed changes? Um, and I think, um, I think the reactions would be uh, several. On the regional pathways, I think it would largely be a relief. Um, one of the things that we spend a lot of time on, uh, which is not the glamour part of clinical research, is all of the different regulatory and, and ethical pathways that we have to go through. So um, I lead a, a, a large study of pneumonia and uh, the causes of pneumonia in children in developing countries. We have seven different sites. We have 10 IRBs. We have two just in Baltimore. Um, so there's a lot of harmonization in trying to get those pathways uh, uh, you know, simplified that would be a welcome relief. Um, I think the idea of shifting some of the responsibility from the phase three to the phase four uh, testing would also be welcome with a couple of caveats. One is um, the, the, the uh, investigator community discounts highly the promise of funding later as opposed to the actual of funding now. So um, there would have to be really concrete and reliable commitments that we're not just shortchanging the whole process. We're going to go for a shorter phase three and a bigger phase four, and here's, here's the funding support for doing that. Um, and then also there would need to be assurances that we could do the science in a 
sufficiently rigorous way in phase four that we wouldn't be compromising what we're learning once we're past the phase uh, three testing. And, and so um, it, it's, a, it's a laudable goal, but making that shift is really going to require some uh, interaction of, of multiple uh, uh, actors. And lastly, on the clinical trial monitoring, um, I think we would embrace this with open arms. Um, we wrestle with the costs in our budget. Um, it's also not the glamour part of clinical research. Um, but we also acknowledge that smart clinical trial monitoring improves the credibility of the work that we do. It can help to make sure that when we put together that final data set that we know that this is the data set and this is uh, what the science says. So um, none of us would want to get away with, the, do away with the clinical trial monitoring, but some uh, rationalization of that would be, um, would be embraced. So. Um, in closing, just uh, talking to Amanda beforehand, she thought, well, you know, how, how are we going to get this to happen? And I, I think um, I think there's a lot of actors that need to move. They're up on this stage talked about. But um, we really need to see some we really need to see some openness from the regulators. I think what we need to see is what I would call um, evidence based courage. We need um, we don't need to do things irrationally, but on the basis of evidence to be able to say to somebody, you don't have to do what the precedents did because we've evaluated those precedents and it turns out some of what they spent money on wasn't necessary. So uh, in closing, I'd like to uh, propose a way forward that links a series of CGD reports. I think we need a, uh, many of you may know the million saved what works in global health. I think we need millions saved what works in regulatory science so that we can do the M&E, you know, out of the last 100 trials that went into you guys, if we went back and looked at all of the clinical trial monitoring, how often did it actually pick up something that was needed? And can we smartly hone that down? You have the data at your disposal. You could go through it and, and do that kind of thing. Then we got to link it with making markets so that these aren't just neglected tropical markets, uh, neglected tropical diseases, and then um, safer, faster, cheaper. That's hey, great. Paul. Uh, thank you. So um, let, let me first just start by saying, as, as uh, some of the previous speakers, that we sort of stand at this opportunity or threshold where there are a huge number of um, candidates in development for neglected diseases. And the challenge to bring those through to full development deliverance to patients is immense. But we have, I think, a sort of societal and moral obligation to do whatever we need to do across the various players t to make that happen. We sort of become victims of our own success in that the opportunities before us uh, are just immense and the struggle is to work out how we would deliver those. I, I think I'd focus on, as a sponsor on two particular elements of the, of the report. The first around the need for the sharing of the limited regulatory agency resources in, in, a, in a regional way. It's quite clear that uh, in, independent agencies uh, just reviewing these sort of studies is, is not going to be anywhere near the amount of capacity that is needed. And we need to really encourage that cooperation through joint joint reviews um, and leveraging outside assistance so the WHO and some of the more developed regulatory agencies also can bring huge experience uh, and capability to this to the task at hand. I think the report recommendations are particularly clever in terms of determining these sort of approaches to be voluntary and non-binding in the first place to encourage agencies to participate and at the same time respecting the uh, national sovereignty that these agencies have in terms of their own independent decision making and getting that balance right between being cooperative and coordinated but still having their uh, independent um, opportunity to make decisions is pretty critical in terms of uh, delivering this sort of approach. I think if we if we believe that the agency resources are currently limited, that is true. It's going to be even worse going forward as these products actually need to be under under full review for, for full use, and then the safety monitoring of the products when they're actually more broadly used. So we have to really crack this issue of regulatory resource at the front end if we stand any chance at all in terms of being able to deal with the additional regulatory burden when the products are in much more widespread use. So as a sponsor, what do we need to do you know, in this sort of space? I think the most important thing is to encourage 
and utilize these sort of uh, mechanisms as they're developed and make sure that you know sponsors are supporting those approaches uh, be it through you know uh, improving transparency of, of data between the agencies driving for more consistent um, data and, and formats of dossiers uh, and and um, mechanisms such as that and maybe even um, improving the fees that get paid for agencies to do this work so it actually has some way of becoming self-financing over the longer term. The other area which the report talks about which is critically important for sponsors is to is to work at actually getting the cost of actually doing this clinical work uh, down, better planning, um, developing simpler and less complex trials, really trying to address this issue of the expense of, um, of clinical monitoring which as we've seen you know, vastly consumes a lot of this budget. So I think it's beholden on sponsors to work with investigators to try and design simpler studies. By the very nature, these studies tend to be large multinational approaches. As Orange just indicated, there's huge logistics just in delivering these sort of studies without sponsors overcomplicating them. And so we really need to address that. And then finally, in that same area, another a sponsor obligation to try and help build some of the infrastructure to make sure that these countries are able to develop more adequate clinical trial centers, helping to build not just the infrastructure and the IT systems, but training, as one of the earlier speakers said, it's actually training on the job, not theoretical training, which is then much more, more difficult to apply. So I too um, congratulate Tom on the work he's done pulling this group together and developing such a well thought out and well written report. And I commend the report to, to everybody that's interested in this area of clinical development and bringing these products to the market for neglected diseases, but most importantly those people are actually active in these activities and actually well placed to actually do something about the recommendations that the report has put before us today. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Michael. Okay, thank you. I, I also want to uh, congratulate CGD on the release of, of this document and particularly Tom. I've worked with Tom on a number of projects. He's a very hard working person as people. One thing about him is he, he always used to wear the same black suit. And I noticed he recently got married and I noticed he has a new suit on today. So that's, congratulations Tom. <laughs> on the suit or the marriage. Uh, uh, well, so I wanted to focus my brief, very brief comments on the regulatory um, pathways section of, of this document. I hope you get a chance to read it. There's um, one of the things it's, 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 it's based on, it, it, two things actually. One has been mentioned by David and other speakers in that with the success of the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates nonprofit product development partnerships, we have many products. And about three years ago, the Gates Foundation surveyed all of the PDPs and ask them what are their biggest challenges as a clinical manufacturing access and actually the one that was at the top was regulatory challenges and a lot of this has to do with the fact that as has been said we're working with these products in endemic countries which have weak regulatory authorities in many cases and in, in our case with ARIS which is developing TB vaccines many of our all of our clinical studies right now at this point are are ongoing in Africa and countries like Uganda and Kenya and Mozambique where the regulatory agencies are relatively weak compared to for instance for example the FDA so I, what this report did is it used as has been mentioned by Tom uh, one of the initiatives of the World Health Organization the African Vaccine Regulators Forum as sort of a starting point to develop some of the harmonization ideas and issues that are that are brought forth in this document. I was just in Mozambique about a month ago and we brought a, a TB vaccine protocol there for joint review and it's an, a very exciting experience if anybody gets a chance to do this I'd welcome you. What's really nice we had six countries we're going into with clinical s studies, six African countries, but FDA representatives and EMEA representatives also sat at the table and we brought our protocol and they they threw us out of the room, actually, but as, as regulatory agencies often do. And that was a nonprofit. I was a little surprised, but anyway. So they all discussed this, and they came back with 30 really good comments. And, they, and you know, and this is a great opportunity where they all sit at the table. It's a training and capacity building opportunity for the African countries since the FDA and EMEA and Health Canada who are more experienced are there. So this, I think this is, a, this is what this is based on and I think it asks for more things like this to be done and at a grander, grander scale. In my last minute, 
so i thought hard about this and you know this offers solutions but now we got to implement it i think the commissioner mentioned implementation of this is you know is the next step so i thought of, of about five uh challenges we have to implementation one is the ability to share information regulatory bodies it's difficult for them often to to share information so we need new new ways of thinking about memorandums of understanding with these african countries uh, for example to go overcome these information sharing obstacles second sponsors need to be aware of these programs and to be willing to use them like for instance in in, in europe there's been the article 58 but it hasn't been used very much so we don't know how well this is going to work and the FDA actually has a guidance document for both drugs and vaccines now for global diseases that haven't really been used much until you get to use them you're not going to know what the difficult issues are uh, three uh, work best if these these harmonization regulatory programs work best if stringent regulatory authorities like the FDA sit at the table and, and for the for the as I mentioned before about uh, training and actually there's uh, exchange programs and things like this can occur between these regulatory agencies that would really be helpful for capacity building and training uh, funding uh, that's an issue that Tom mentioned for these types some of us PDPs that are funded by Gates have been put giving a little bit of our budget towards funding mostly the travel to put these types of meetings together but it's we need some trick-or-treat kind of mechanism you know in today's to try to find some put like maybe pay for service things like FDA has PDUFA maybe we can have a pay for service kind of approach to this kind of thing and then support for governments uh, a number of the African governments they just don't put the enforcement behind these regulatory agencies and they don't have have that strength so we need to find some way as mentioned before these are non-binding resolutions right now so in these regulatory agencies in Uganda and Kenya they need some muscle behind them some strength to be able to move these things forward so those are my comments and I appreciate being here today Tom okay. thank you so much for your brevity to the panel so I'm proposing that we take two questions from the audience who has the most burning question are um, also quite open to put it nicely to influence from other emerging countries or developing countries. And I'm specifically thinking of uh, China. Uh, the investments of China in Africa in health are now larger than those of the World Bank. And uh, in this particular field, of course, Brazil. Um, then there are other uh, particular, let's say, mid-level of emerging countries in Africa itself that are active in this field. Um, I didn't see that much, either in the presentations or in the report, about capitalizing on the strengths of the agencies in those countries. So let's that say looking mm -hmm. at the relationship between Brazil and the African countries or South Africa itself. Mm -hmm. I would be very interested in your uh, views on that. Absolutely. Uh, one more question. <coughs> Imo Ibia. Um, I'm with Merck and Company, uh, but I'm here on my behalf, mm -hmm. partly because I'm African originally uh, from Nigeria, and I do have uh, great interest uh, in this area um, as a physician, a pediatrician, an infectious disease um, specialist trained in this country and trained back home in Nigeria. I do clearly relate to all the issues um, that have been identified in the report. At Merck, I actually also do work on policy-related issues on neglected tropical disease, and I was very glad uh, to see some of the names from my company uh, that in some ways participated in preparing the report. So I, I want to touch on one or two or maybe three things, and I hope to <laughs> uh, the, the first has to do with um, the fact that, and I do know that Dr. Hamburg is here. She may not know all the you know little things that go on at the agency, but um, the, the agency has been doing quite a lot to try and address some of these issues. Uh, the guidance on the, uh, this recent draft guidance on neglected tropical disease has been alluded to earlier. 
Uh, the other thing that has happened uh, even more recently has been the draft guidance on risk-based uh, oversight of clinical trials. And related to that is that um, the EMA has also issued a similar kind of document, which is the reflection paper on the risk-based quality uh, management in clinical trials. I guess I raise this because it goes back to the need for the stringent regulatory authorities to closely uh, collaborate with each other to try and address the issues. Uh, the next thing perhaps I wanted to say is the fact that um, that um, the WHO has been doing quite a lot. It, again, it goes back to um, the need for collaboration. Article 58 was mentioned earlier. But let me leave that alone and actually talk about what I think is at the heart of my presence here. And I'm glad that we are doing this at the Center for Global Development. I do believe that you do have a political component to your activities and not just healthcare. Because at the end of the day, yes, uh, some funding is going to go into those countries, Nigeria in particular, which I know very well. But at the end of the day, you can only do so much in a place like Nigeria where things are deteriorating by the hour. To what extent are we going to do something that ultimately will address the lack of political leadership, the corruption, the failing infrastructure, the failing schools, the failing healthcare systems in places like that. I think fr from my perspective, that is really the biggest challenge. Okay, thank you very much. And okay, because Nancy's my boss, I'm gonna let her talk, go ahead. <laughs> Whom should we be looking at for leadership? Let me make it more specific. Is it WHO? Is it the FDA? Is it the Gates Foundation? Who, whom should we try to make in charge for the next step? Okay, Tom, go ahead. Sure, I, I'll respond to some of those items and then turn it over to my uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, first, to to respond to Ak, first of all, it's nice to see you again. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, the working group, of course, is much broader than what is represented at this uh, panel. We actually had uh, 22 members, including a representative of the Thai FDA and also a representative of their working group on pharmaceutical development. We had uh, someone who uh, leads the regional regulatory work for NEPAD as part of uh, 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 of the working group and a former uh, regulatory authority from Tanzania. We also had a clinical trial investigator and the head of a clinical trial networker, Fred Binka, who is uh, head of the uh, in-depth network, and he was also a member of this working group. So it's much, much broader than we were able to uh, pull together uh, here today. We've also spent a fair amount of time working through the uh, various WHO bodies that have been working on this, including the developing country vaccine regulatory network we presented to them. We traveled out to ASEAN to speak with them as well. We uh, have been working through uh, the AVREF, African Vaccine Regulatory Forum. So we've, we've really done uh, a lot of that work and I wanna make sure the working group is recognized for identifying that early as a uh, priority. But to get more uh, deeply at that issue, this uh, set of approaches are really actually meant to unleash uh, the uh, regulatory capacity of those countries by having them cooperate. We do that regionally instead of across regions uh, for a couple reasons. The first is when you look at the pattern of clinical trial activity, while they tend to be multiple uh, countries, they're really regionally focused for neglected diseases. So it makes a lot of sense for those countries to cooperate. But also if you look at regional approaches to regulation that have worked, they're almost always, uh, uh, or uh, multi-country approaches to regulation that have worked, they're almost always regional. And there is a, uh, a, a peer dynamic, an understanding of uh, shared issues. I think that uh, is often very important in that context. Um, in terms of uh, a report card, I don't want to, I, I, I'm interested in what my panelists are going to think about this as well, but I, I do think there is a role 
for for many of uh, the entities that uh, Nancy mentioned. I, I I think the WHO has played a critical role in supporting regional approaches to clinical trial reg regulation. They've done it incredibly cheaply. Um, it really is when you look at the numbers uh, in terms of what they've managed to accomplish. It's really quite striking. Uh, they bring a lot of credibility to the table, but as many of us know, WHO is in the midst of some serious funding challenges. So I think if they're going to be equipped to play a collaborative role in this, there needs to be more support for WHO in their regulatory work, which ties to donors. And I think donors uh, have, uh, uh, whether it's the Gates Foundation or the USNIH, there are other donors as well. The Wellcome Trust have all been involved in these projects. And uh, I, I think there needs to be support not only for WHO or regional platforms like NEPAD, but uh, also, again, by uh, requiring that their grantees take up these approaches and use these pathways so they do become supported. One of the things that Mike mentioned was a PTUFA type mechanism. That's actually very much what we've, uh, as Mike knows, has been envisioned with this project, is that in the long run, it would become self-sustaining. It would be a fee-based. Uh, regional approach and uh, persist in that way. But I've, I've gone on too long already. Let me uh, turn over to my colleagues. To the three questions that are on the table, I, I do want to echo Tom's comments about the fact that the participation regionally, globally, um, in the working group is much more broad than what's represented, you know, here at the at the table today. And completely take your point that this is a, this needs to be, um, an initiative that has organic and very deep participation from around the world if it's going to be successful. And I think that you know, you're also, the working group is a group of folks who travel broadly, who work in many different geographies, and who I think are constantly in the process of hearing from, consulting with, and being informed by their experiences with colleagues from around the world. So uh, we, we represent one slice here, but I think it's merely in many ways an accident of who was able probably to, to be here today. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say to respond to um, the, the comments and the questions from our, uh, our Merck colleague uh, was just to, to really sort of with respect to political leadership, I think, you know, uh, comment that there are, are tremendous challenges, whether we're talking about Nigeria or many other countries or regions around the world, and to recognize that there, that there are political leadership elements that will be necessary to sort of enable these more regulatory and technical type of solutions we've talked about and to not underestimate those. I'm not honestly sure where the answers come from, and you may actually have some ideas. It would be great to talk afterwards. Um, and then to, uh, to come back to the idea of a scorecard, which Amanda um, mentioned to me as we were waiting to, uh, to actually come up here today and sort of <coughs> had all of 20 minutes or so to think about it. But it's something that we're always thinking about as one of the, the large funders in the space. Without accountability, without a scorecard a year from now that we can all look at and ask ourselves collectively and, and have people externally ask us as well, how are we doing and what are we doing differently and in what way are we making a difference, then I think if, if we're not doing that, then the report sort of gets shelved back in my office in Seattle, and it, it was a pleasure working with these guys and with Tom and with everyone at the center, but what difference did we make? And so I think that an accountability mechanism, a scorecard, a dashboard is always important, and I would love to be you know, here a year from now talking about that. I think it's really tricky to choose the right metrics to, uh, you know, under which we can evaluate something like this over a one, five, and 10 year 10-year basis, but I think it's important to think about. And um, I think also as we think about, you know, would the Gates Foundation have a role, perhaps? Um, are we in a position to take a leadership role in that? I don't know. Um, you know, we are, we are very cognizant of the fact that we are one of many funders in this space, many actors in this space, and that while frequently our name ends up on the marquee, uh, it does, that does not recognize the contributions uh, deep and wide that we have from many of our other partners, whether it's, uh, whether it's industry, whether it's regulatory agencies, whether it's representatives from the product development partnerships or investigators like Oren. So I think that you know, in, in wanting to approach that question of who best to lead, uh, we need to recognize that this is a multi-actor type of um, Situation, and so we do want to have, I think, more of a consortium approach to creating that type of a scorecard. 
Commissioner and thank her again for being here. It would be one good thing for the Gates Foundation to find <coughs> the right place to do the research that Arn Levine mentioned. It's an example to understand exactly, you know, how these costs could be. It's just an example and probably not it's C G D. But I thought that was a good idea. And I mean I just want to say somebody has to put together the consortium. So I frankly always worry when it's left to only cooperation without leadership. So I don't know if it's Gates Foundation or where it should be, but I hope one of you will tell us where we should look to for leadership. Right. Okay, Orrin, thank you, Nancy. Yeah, just really quickly, I think if you're going to make a scorecard, you need to score each of the actors in this <clears throat> in the space in which they can they can be scored. Um, so, um, you know, talked about maybe doing some monitoring and evaluation of, of the most recent uh, trials and things that have been submitted. And I know it's really hard because your dossiers are all super secret, but if there's some way that we could help you with students to go through, you know, all your dossiers and go through the M&E and all that kind of stuff, I'd love to be able to help you to come back here next year and say, in the last year we reviewed everything, we found five ways that we can, you know, improve the efficiency of trials without even even remotely impacting on the safety of the uh, of the participants I think that would be huge and it would be a real sign of of the kind of leadership that people are serious about this and um, I think actually you know it'll take a lot of different actors to 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 come to it but um, but a, a signal that there's really hope for a kind of being able to scale back some of this stuff with on on the basis of evidence without sacrificing safety would make sponsors feel more comfortable investigators feel more comfortable and countries feel more comfortable so that's just one one score Paul? Um, yeah so a very challenging question in terms of the scorecard of course in, in the best um, sense of the word a, a, a good scorecard is always balanced so I agree you know with the comments that David made around all the various actors need need to play a part in this. I, I think um, I think the WHO clearly is in a good position to be a coordinator, a facilitator, if they're given given more resource to do that. Uh, and of course, the donors can be very influential beyond the dollar in terms of you know how how, how they invest in some of these things and some of the uh, the guiding principles that they would put behind some of these sort of programs. I just want one comment about the regulators because um, cl clearly a regional approach make sense but for that to be successful you need some players in the region who themselves step to the plate and would take a lead you know on behalf of other countries that, that are in that regional space so I think you know the FDA clearly have a lot of experience uh, and can leverage experience as can the European agencies but this is more around helping to build confidence in the in the agencies within these other regions as distinct from you know, trying to impose an FDA or an EMA solution, which clearly wouldn't work. I think the trick is how the, those those more, more resourced agencies can bring the experience they have and help the regional agencies in Africa, for example, translate that into what would work for them. What are some of those best practices and learnings for them to adopt and drive forward, rather than you know trying to impose some of this learning from from other regions directly? And I think that's a very fine line to walk in terms of you bring that experience and, and, and willingness without actually looking as if you're sort of imposing solutions on agencies which aren't necessarily going to be receptive to that sort of approach. So I think that's that's an area where the agencies maybe need to do a bit more work and dialogue in terms of how they would facilitate that experience. Thanks. Okay. Michael. So in, in mentioning some of the um, challenges for implementation, sharing information, regulatory authorities working together, the need for sponsors to use these. I think it, it just comes down to much like the product development partnerships work under Gates. It's got to be partnerships of, of everyone, including stringent regulatory authorities, regulatory authorities from emerging countries like China and, and uh, India, Brazil, uh, et cetera, and, uh, and the regulatory authorities uh, from the lower income countries as well. They all, they all got to 
play a part in, in this if, it, if they're going to make it work. And maybe something like the ICH at a developing country level could be useful for, for harmonization of both protocols and processes. Uh, pharma, and I hope the PDPs themselves can be a part of this, you know, uh, working with um, the regulatory agencies. The WHO is a very trusted partner. They have to be in the mix, I think, and the stakeholders like the Gates Foundation and the Ministries of Health from the governments to make this all work together. Now, who's going to lead it, who's going to be the champions is a big question, but uh, I think it'll only work as, as a partnership um, in some specific ideas. And the scorecard will need evaluation tools. I think we need to develop tools to be able to measure this. So. OK. I'm going to let Tom say one more 30-second thing, and then we will conclude. Go ahead. I will do my best to be uncharacteristically uh, brief here. And I think one, th one way of doing this is looking at the existing initiatives that exist now and whether they take this on. There is an initiative at the World Bank looking at regional platforms to supporting regulation. Do they take up clinical trial regulation? WHO has a number of existing regulations uh, or n a number of existing initiatives on regional approaches to regulation. Are they funded to, to do that work? Do they attract the donor support? On the country level, do they send people uh, to participate in these activities? What real commitments do you see to them supporting these? There's actually a number of also, I should have pointed out before, initiatives that exist now trying to address this issue of the lack of productivity and the cost of clinical trials. One of them is a public-private partnership with uh, Duke University and the FDA. Do they take on the challenges of international clinical trials in low-income countries where these issues are actually around cost and efficiency are most salient. And I think you could look at those as very tangible things within a, a year uh, time frame and whether or not they, uh, they, they take up all the work of this, uh, this uh, terrific group that I've had the opportunity to be involved with. Well, thank you very much to our participants and to the audience. Um, I'd like to encourage you to continue to follow our work in health. We'll be trying to track some of the recommendations and identifying a champion. I'm sorry that Oak left because that was, uh, I was going to ask the World Bank to do some things, don't you think? Um, anyhow, so thank you all. Thank you very much, Commissioner Hamburg, and to our panelists, and to Tom for leading such a great working group. And I'll let you go to the reception. Thank you.